On today's episode, I am working on the most disgusting piece of furniture I have ever worked on in the history of my YouTube channel and before that. This piece was gross. I got it for free off of Facebook Marketplace, so at least I didn't spend money on it. It needed a ton of work, but the filth on it was really what made it the most special. <laughs> we had to pull out the big guns when it came to cleaning this piece before we could even start working on it. I normally don't show the cleaning process, but since this was so extra gross, I thought it might be kind of entertaining to see a real before and after. And the before and after happens before I even start working on it, just before it was dirty and after it got clean. The next thing that I'm going to work on in the video is this cute little blue side chair. It's for my living room makeover. All of the pieces in this video are for my living room makeover. I'm making over my formal living room into a fun place that my family can hang out in and actually use on a daily basis. I got this chair for $20 off of Facebook Marketplace and it just really needed a good cleaning. So I'm going to show you a little bit about how I do that. And then I'm going to work on this lamp right here. It has seen better days, but it came from a family who had lost a loved one and this was part of the estate. So I can't wait to give it new life again. You already know from the preview how gross and dirty this hutch is, but let me talk to you about its potential. This thing is all mahogany veneered and it is very solidly built. It's not an antique. I'm going to guess that it's probably from the 1950s and maybe 1940s, but I really do feel like it's from the 1950s. It's smaller than the normal sized hutch that you would see nowadays. The inside was in really excellent condition. It was not as dirty in there, mostly just dusty inside. The glass case really protected it from all the yucky stuff on the outside that it experienced over its life. If I had to guess, I would say that most of the yucky stuff on there is probably cigarette nicotine. On the back, you can see the, the markings from the factory it came from, which shows you that it was not antique. Also, just the way that it's built, you can tell that it's not an antique piece. I'm going to use Dawn Power Wash as my main thing that I'm going to clean this piece with because Dawn Power Wash is a really good degreaser and it seems to have a disgustingly thick film of some kind of greasy substance. I think it's nicotine buildup. But this Dawn Power Wash works extremely well on anything sticky or greasy and I'm going to let it sit a little bit until the bubbles turn more into a liquid. And I'm definitely spraying it very, very heavily on here. I almost use an entire bottle of the Dawn Power Wash just from spraying it on there. But it's definitely worth it. There's tons of degreasers out there that you can use. But this one is more gentle and um, safe. The other stuff can be pretty toxic smelling. Here you can see how it's turning into liquid. The bubbles are starting to go away and you can see the yellowy brown coming out, which I think is nicotine. It could also be um, furniture polish and furniture wax over time as well that um, they just did over and over and over again and it built up and then dust got into that waxy substance and it was introduced to heat being outdoors. So then that wax remelted again. That's possible that what I'm cleaning off is just furniture wax with a little bit of dust mixed in. But the brush that I'm using is from Amazon. It's extremely durable. I have had this thing for probably five years and it works really well. And since it's synthetic fibers, it's easy to clean off. It doesn't actually stain. You saw how clean it got just from putting it in water. I will have that brush linked down below in my description box on my Amazon store. Oh, look at that. I'm using shop towels to wipe it down. Um, you can get shop towels really cheap from Costco. But look at the difference right here. I'm not even done. This is just my first pass. Look at the left side versus the right side. Look at that black buildup stuff in the center from people pushing the drawer closed right there. Look at the drips from where the Dawn Power Wash has dripped down and kind of dried. Look at the difference between how gross the right side is and how clean the left side is. And that's just with my first pass of cleaning it. We cleaned this thing all day. Look at the buildup on this. It looks like root beer almost. Like I said, this is definitely the dirtiest piece I have ever worked on. A lot of people would probably turn away, turn this piece away and not work on it. They would say, that's gross. I'm not messing with it. You never know what, what's in there, et cetera, et cetera. But the inside was actually really clean <laughs> besides some cobwebs like you can see here. And then I'll show you what those papers are right now. 
somebody had left two cut out newspaper recipes in there. The first one was for uh, sugarless cookies. And later on in the video, I'm actually going to cook the recipes that I found in here just out of curiosity. I'm going to guess, oh look, it says 1990 right there. So they're not antique recipes or anything like that. They're not some, some extremely old or, or um, outdated recipe. They're from the 90s. It's not that long ago. But I still wanted to try it. I tried both. And I can't wait to show you them later in the video. They're at the very end of the video. So if you want to see what those recipes turn out to be, then don't forget to check those out at the end. The doors here um, had a piece of molding missing. And I didn't want to recreate the molding because I thought that the piece had a ton of detail already. And I, I think that it can do with having less detail on the doors. I know there's some people who are probably thinking that it would look better with the detail and that's fine. There is no wrong answer here. But when I pulled off these details in the corners, I noticed the backside has a little bit of mold growing on it. So, so you can see the black staining back there. So I am glad that I pulled those off because that is not something I want to keep in this piece. Mold is pretty toxic. Now I'm just using some needle nose pliers to pull out the nails that were holding the molding in and this is such a fun process. I love doing this. For some reason it's like a relaxing easy thing to do. Every once in a while you'll have a nail that breaks and so that makes it kind of hard but I really do enjoy pulling the nails out. Now I'm going to fill in everything that is not level or the nail holes with some wood filler and let that dry and repeat and do it again and I'm going to sand it and then cover the entire thing with my favorite primer which is just pure shellac. We did this project months and months ago. So there is some footage that is lost uh, from this project. And so I didn't show the part where we used shellac as a primer and then I did the first coat of paint on it. But we do have the part where we primed the inside. So you can see that we're using an automotive primer. It's in a gray color. And this is a really good primer for if you're going to go over it with a lighter color that um, even white, it's it's a great primer to go over it with white. And um, my husband's just spraying it in there because we had tried to remove the backing of the china hutch because I had intended to hand paint everything inside. Um, but the backing was just splintering and falling apart as we were trying to take it off just because of its age. And so we decided to not mess with it, keep everything built so that it keeps its structural integrity. And that way we don't have to go out and buy a whole new piece of plywood for the back, but he just sprayed inside instead. After he finished spraying with that gray primer, he went over it with a white enamel paint by Rust-Oleum. I love this paint for surfaces that are going to need to be really durable like shelves or dining sets or kitchen cabinets. I redid my kitchen with that enamel paint as well and it's extremely durable once it cures. It takes a little while to cure maybe like a week um, up to 21 days for some climates and some situations but we ended up running out of it and he sprayed as much as he could and did, got his best coverage as he could with what we had but once that was dried and cured we brought it inside and I ended up doing um, hand painting a coat of paint over it on the areas that were still a little bit blotchy especially on the backing and plus the backing plywoods of pieces like this tend to soak paint up so much because they're not sealed very well and they're they're not sanded very smooth like they're kind of a rough surface and not sealed well so they take in tons more paint than the actual shelves do so they require so many more coats than the rest but here's what it's looking like at this point I hand painted the handles that are on the drawers and put them back on. So those are the original ones. You can see the back on the, on the inside of the hutch is a little bit blotchy. So I'm going to just take care of that right now. But I wanted to show you uh, up close, you know, what we got, what we're working with now, since I did lose some of the footage of what we had already done. So you can see I got a first coat on there. The color that I'm using is called recycled glass, and it's just a little bit lighter and brighter in the color I did my formal living room or sorry my formal dining room makeover if you haven't checked that out you really need to see it it's amazing 
I'm just using clear paint, uh, their trim paint that you would use on baseboards or doors, etc. because that's a little more durable than a semi-gloss finish, so that also makes it more durable. And this paint has no VOCs. I am not sponsored for saying this. This is a paint that I've had on hand for years that I used in my previous home even. But I am extremely sensitive to smells. Um, like I have like allergic reactions to, to um, chemicals and paints and cleaning supplies. So I'm trying to only use things that won't irritate my throat and ears and just all my sinuses in general. And this paint doesn't have any smell and it makes me feel more comfortable painting inside with my kids around. Next I'm going to use this awesome brush. This is my favorite brush to paint with. I don't always have it on hand um, but I would choose it <laughs> over any brush um, if I did have it on hand and it was clean and ready to go. But I just went to Lowe's and got a few more of them because sometimes I forget to wash my brushes. I'm a busy mom. I got four kids. You know how it is. But I have a nice, perfect, clean one. It's a zebra brush. You can get it from any hardware store. I like the square one that has the angle on it because you can get into all sorts of different um, curves and like divots and dents and moldings and everything. It's just a really good brush for all sorts of details and then it also paints on really smooth. I will see if I can find it on Amazon and link it on my Amazon store for you as well just in case you're somebody who would rather have it sent to your house instead of having to go to the store to pick it up. But I'm just doing this second coat. I, I usually do two and a half coats on everything because a lot of times the second coat covers 90% of my piece of furniture perfectly, but then there's this 10% that needs a little bit of touch up. So I always call it two and a half coats. So I'm doing my two and a half coats here. And make sure that you keep watching to towards the end of the video because I'm going to wait to reveal these until they're all three finished. So wait until after I finish the lamp and then I will reveal all three of them together because I feel like they look so amazing together in the room and the room just comes alive. It looks so exciting and beautiful. I love it. You're going to love it too. And if you like doing furniture flips and thrifting and antiques, then please consider hitting subscribe because that is a lot of what I do here on my channel. If you're new to my channel, you have probably been wondering this entire time why I didn't tape off the glass. And the reason why is because it's extremely easy to take a razor blade and scrape the paint off at the end and you don't have to buy tape. And plus, when you use paint tape, a lot of times um, if you don't go through the extra step of spraying a clear coat or painting on a clear coat over the tape, you're going to end up getting bleed through under that tape anyways. So paint tape is my nemesis. I just don't believe in it <laughs> for most cases. And I'm using a razor blade to take the paint off of the glass. It does not hurt the glass in any way. I apologize that my camera kept readjusting focus there. Sorry about that. But I'm just going over it by hand with a razor blade. It takes a few minutes. Um, this was a little bit harder just because, like I said, we worked on this thing months ago. So that overspray had been on this glass for a very long time. So it was a little bit harder to do. I ended up finding my little um, razor blade handle and using that. And my husband did the rest of it because I had to go take care of the kiddos. But here is an example of how I painted over the handles on the drawers. This is the original handle that went on the glass door on the front of the china hutch. I'm using chalk paint to go over it because I want it to have a matte finish and be like a little bit country. I really like French country. I like traditional. I like um, antiques and a little bit farmhouse not a whole lot farmhouse but just a little bit I like things to look lived in and I like it to be to where it's not too perfect to where um, my kids can't touch it I want things to be a little bit worn um, so that way if anything ever got a scratch on it a dent on it or something just from my kids living in this house and existing and being happy and playing um, that way there's no consequence about it you know it's like oops oh well that's all right you know that, that thing's got scratches and dents it's no big deal it just shows the story of its life and that's what I'm going for with the look of this handle right here and plus the paint on on the hutch itself I don't particularly care for things to be too perfect and I, I am a little bit different than other people on YouTube for that. But I mean, I have four kids and I want my house to be lived in. And I love that the story of these pieces are still showing. I don't want to restore it to where it looks brand new because I got it because I like that it's old. I want to keep that patina. I want to keep it looking old. The handles that I'm putting on now, these little tiny ball handles, are from uh, Hobby Lobby and they're usually $3.99 but if you get them on the half off times 
um, than their two bucks. So you can't beat two dollars for a classic looking handle like this. Even on Amazon, they probably wouldn't be that cheap. Although Amazon does have some really cheap handles, just not in this style. They're more expensive in this style. And if you're wondering how to know when they're half off, all you have to do is go to Hobby Lobby's website and see what their ad is for that week or two weeks or whatever. Do you remember me making over this mirror recently? So I redid this mirror. Um, I painted it and then I added the shells on using some JB Weld. I'm hanging it up here. I put some nails in the top of the hutch so that way it does not slide. And then I'm going to finally decorate with it in the room. I thought it would look really pretty up above this hutch. You can see how short that hutch is. So our ceilings are pretty short ceilings. I think they are 8 foot. And so our windows are down to about seven feet. And so this is maybe six feet tall. It's a pretty short hutch. And uh, I wanted to make sure that the top of it was decorated well so it didn't look short and squatty in the room. This china I got from an online auction. And I think I got, let's see, one, two, three, seven, eight, eight, nine pieces, I think, for around $20. Blue and white china like this is really expensive right now. You used to be able to find it, it was like a dime a dozen, but now it's really expensive. Everybody's collecting it. Look at these, look at how the different size of the handles are. One has like a more fat handle and one has a more skinny handle. All made in England. I'm guessing these ones are probably antique. Um, the first one, the platter that I showed you is actually a Wedgwood, which is very valuable. This says it was made in Italy. I got this also from um, online auctions for estate sales. I get a lot of stuff that way. Um, it's sometimes it can be expensive. Oh, look how I measure my center. <laughs> that is definitely a feminine way of measuring. <laughs> At least that's how I see it. I know my husband is way more particular. He would have spent like 15 minutes finding the perfect center. And I'm just an eyeballer. I eyeball everything. The, the hooks that I put on the plate are from Amazon. I buy them in like a little bulk box. Um, and they're in silver. They come in different colors too. I'll try and link that in my Amazon store as well just because I think they're great. And they're way cheaper online than they are in person if you can even find them in any stores. Tell me in the comment section down below if you've ever found any uh, plate hooks like these in stores. I can't find them. They're so hard to find. And I know that Hobby Lobby has some that are the kind that are like a little easel, but they're still pretty expensive and they're not really the style that I like. The selection is very slim. But I'm putting nails in the back of this hutch and hanging the plates as if I were hanging them on the wall. I thought that made them appear um, more prominent in the piece. And then I'm just decorating it with some china that I got. Some of it you might recognize. I had decorated my bookshelves with them, but my baby keeps taking them off of there. So I decided to put them inside the cabinet instead. And then my grandmother's books are going to grace the bottom shelf of this to lift up the other pieces I'm putting. I got these from an in-person estate sale. I think I spent $2.50 a piece for them. And I thought they were really cute. They're like very chinoiserie with the koi fish on there and the blue and white and the handle looks like bamboo. I got this at that same estate sale that I got the coffee mugs from and it has a beautiful scene painted on either side. And of course you remember this one. That one I bought a long time ago, which you probably saw in my uh, dining room makeover. And now it's time to close it up. I've redecorated that thing so many times before I finally figured out that less was more. I'll show you later. But here my daughter got a crayon and already um, blessed this little chair with her artwork. <laughs> I got this chair for $20 on Facebook Marketplace. And um, it was from a couple that was downsizing. They were moving, I think, to Colorado from Texas. And so they were selling almost everything they had. And it was kind of funny that we had quite a bit of similarities of our stories. They were a couple with four kids and my husband and I are a couple with four kids, etc. And they were moving and we had just moved. And it was, it was kind of interesting seeing how our lives were so similar. But it was actually kept really clean. It was just dusty. She kept it in her guest room and it was never used, which you can totally tell. I don't know. It's probably from the 80s or 90s if I had to guess. So definitely not antique by any means. I guess that would still be considered vintage now. But I'm using my little green machine to clean it really well. I'm only going to show you how I cleaned the cushion. I did clean the entire thing from top to bottom, including the skirting and everything. And something to consider when you're buying vintage stuff is to pull the seat out and look for activity of bugs. So you would see bug poop or dead bugs, etc. If there's any of that, walk away. <laughs> now it's time to decorate it. I was trying to figure out how to make it 
look a little more cozy, have more character, and um, give it a bigger appearance because it's a it's a pretty petite chair. It's quite small. And I decided that the skirting needed something a little bit extra. So I went, of course, to my favorite store, Hobby Lobby, and <laughs> got some ribbons. And they were dirt cheap, $2.99 for three yards. So that's nine feet for $2.99. That's cheaper than Walmart, you guys, cheaper than Walmart. And you can also get that on sale. And I tried out a few different looks before I came to the look that I wanted. And these were really cute. I loved them, but I feel like it was just too white compared to the whole rest of the piece. I didn't want it to have like a, for some reason it was giving me like tennis, tennis outfit vibes. <laughs> I felt like there was just something too sporty about that white stripe on there. So I instead did this little tassel piece on the bottom. I feel like a four inch tasseled trim would have looked really pretty on there but that stuff's very expensive so my little $2.99 investment on here was more <laughs> budget wise for our personal budget we didn't have a huge budget to do this room makeover the way that I love applying trim onto things if you've been watching my channel for a long time you know I love adding trim to upholstery I don't know it just brings so much joy into my life <laughs> I use a fabric hot glue so if you're concerned that hot glue is not the appropriate way to attach it and that it must be sewed on, etc., I have heard from somebody who was a professional upholsterer for his whole life that they use hot glue to apply stuff like this all the time. So it is appropriate and the fabric hot glue works extremely well and I've been using it for a long time. The fabric one is a white stick of hot glue so you'll see that it looks white in there and it does go on a little bit white so you are going to want to be careful that you're not getting it in a place where it's not supposed to be because you'll notice it but I'm just going to go over it right now with the hot glue I do a little bit at a time first and then I um, I push it down press it down really hard and make sure that it's glued on really nice and tight another great thing about using hot glue to apply it is if for some reason you really roughhoused with this piece of trim on the bottom of your chairs and a piece of it became detached all you would have to do is just go get that hot glue gun and reattach it and it's on there again until the next time somebody really roughhouses with the trim on your chair although I would say pretty confidently nobody's gonna roughhouse with the piece of trim on the bottom of your chair I don't know for sure I don't know what kind of lives you live <laughs> but I know even with my four kids and two dogs that this trim will not be detached in any way or bothered in any way <laughs> and will stay on there for the entire lifetime that we own the chair it really works and it's so cheap so fast and so easy and those are my favorite kind of crafts to do I'm really curious to know, so please comment below and let me know if you have tried adding trim onto your pieces of upholstery since watching my channel. I know I have added tons of different trim onto upholstered pieces since starting this channel, and I really genuinely want to know if anybody has tried it at home since watching it on my channel. It would make me so happy to hear that somebody else tried it and loved it as much as I do. I'm going to wait to show you the reveals for everything until they're all done at the end. So next we're going to work on this lamp. This lamp came from a family who had um, their grandfather had passed on and they were um, going to be donating all of his things to Goodwill. And I offered um, to take that and remake it over and give it life again. And I loved the grandpa ingenuity here. He had to use a washer and a nut instead of a finial on top of the lampshade. But right now I'm going to suit up because I want to spray paint these lamps in a silver color. I've already explained to you I'm extremely chemically sensitive now and I want to, I mean, I want to show you to the lengths that I have to go to now in order to use spray paint. <laughs> I got this suit off Amazon. I should have worn gloves, but I forgot. But I'm going to spray paint this metallic paint on there in silver since I prefer silver over gold decor. But this suit... Um, did a really good job. I didn't really have any reaction. I did have to adjust here. You could see me adjusting because my goggles kind of broke the seal on the nose of my mask. But before I never had any reaction to paint. I could just go outside and spray paint like a normal person. And one day it all changed and for some reason anytime I smell strong smells like paints or glues, I feel like I have the flu the rest of the day. Like it makes me actually sick now. And I wish that wasn't the case but it is so now this is my reality. <laughs> Usually my husband does the paints like this for me and it was extremely 
extremely hot that day. But look at the reveal of the chair now. We're going to reveal everything. But first, let me show you how beautiful this chair turned out. It looks so gorgeous. It's hard to believe that such a small trim can make such a big difference. The lamp, all I did was spray paint it in silver and put a new shade and a new ball on there that I got from the at-home store, and it looks like a brand new lamp. It looks gorgeous. It's also one of those reading lamps where you can pull it out and push it back in, which I think is so cool and a very high quality lamp. So thank you to that family and their grandfather. Now you can see the rest of the hutch all put together. The green color on camera is much more vibrant than it is in person. It is still vibrant in person, but it looks more bright on camera. But either way, I still think it looks absolutely gorgeous. The blue and white it looks amazing with this tone of green and it helps to pull in all the stuff we did in my formal dining room. If you haven't seen that, I will link it in the description box down below. You're really going to want to see that makeover. But I love this like granny chic or grand millennial style and French country put together. And I can't wait to finish the rest of the room, but this corner is finished. I still think that the area in front of this chair probably needs an ottoman or footrest of some kind. So I'm gonna try and DIY something there in uh, an upcoming video. And then of course, on the other side of this wall, I need something here in this corner to balance out the other side. So maybe a desk, a table, or a chest of some kind. I'm not really sure what I'm gonna put there yet. Let me know in the comments what you think I should put on that side. I can't really find that same chair over again to match both sides the same. So I'm kind of playing around with different ideas at the moment, but look at how great everything looks together. You can see the green in the dining room right now. But now it's time to make those two recipes that I found inside of the China Hutch. First, we're going to start with the salmon drops. This reminded me a lot of salmon patties. I know that's a more common thing to eat nowadays, which is just like a fried canned salmon. <laughs> Here's the ingredients that I needed was canned salmon, oil, egg, flour, and then I needed also baking powder. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up this oil so that it gets nice and hot while I'm mixing the ingredients. And I'm going by the instructions. Although the instructions are very short, so I just am um, being a little more descriptive. <laughs> I'm going to flake the salmon, as I said in the instructions, and then I'm going to add in one beaten egg into the salmon mixture. You could also mix all the ingredients into the liquid that you drained out of your salmon. Um, that would work really well too and it would probably would work better than how I did it in this tiny bowl. <laughs> Next you're going to put in a cup of flour and this is going to help you to fry it. It's kind of like chicken fried salmon in a way. Um, later on I, I kind of figured out it was really just like chicken fried salmon which is interesting. I mean and now it's time to add in one heaping teaspoon of baking powder. Heaping means you don't level it off. So you're going to have a little extra on the top there. No, I didn't do it wrong. It was in the directions. <laughs> you're going to mix that in really, really well to make sure that it gets into every little bit. And I added back just a tiny bit of the juice. And then I'm going to drop a spoon size amount um, into the oil. I'd put four in at a time. The recipe said to do so. And the trick here with deep frying stuff without wasting a ton of oil is to use a pot with higher sides and have it be deeper. You don't want to use a wide frying pan, first of all, because that's dangerous. And second of all, just because um, you can make it deeper with less oil this way. You do have to cook less at a time, though. I don't have any commercial fryers in my house. And in fact, I almost never fry anything like this anyway. The oil that I'm using is uh, canola oil, which is not healthy for you. So this is not a healthy recipe, but it's, it's better than eating fast food, I think. But you're just going to cook them until they turn into little chicken nuggets, <laughs> as my kids called it. And when I tasted these, they're pretty good. You'll get to see my reaction in just a second. Um, but they were pretty good. I think that um, the crispier you make it, in my opinion, the better they are. I just personally like a good crunch on my fried food. <laughs> and uh, If you like it really crunchy, let me know in the comments because some people like it to be softer. But hey, they're pretty good. Nice crunch to it. It was kind of just a, a, like a, a salmon nugget. <laughs> Nice and crispy. One thing that I would change about it though is that it didn't have any seasoning to it in the recipe. So I added some blackened seasoning to the mixture before I continued frying more of them. I think that crab oil would make for a really good seasoning to use. I just didn't have any on hand. And I would have actually used more seasoning than that. It still could have used some more. But 
I found out also that the more irregular shaped you made them, the more crunchy they could get. And so from the from then on, I made them to be able to be a lot more crunchy. And I thought that a nice big wedge of watermelon would go really well with this lunch. And my family fully enjoyed it. So thank you to that recipe. The next thing that I made were these sugarless cookies. It says it's supposed to be a diabetic friendly recipe, although we know more now about, about diabetes and there's way too many carbohydrates in this recipe uh, for it to be diabetic friendly for real. So if you are diabetic and you're trying this, it is not gonna, it, it could spike your blood sugar still. But it has tons of ingredients in it and I went up to HEB and bought all the ingredients that I didn't have already and then used the ones that I did have, which the only thing I really had was like nutmeg and this vanilla that I accidentally spilled <laughs> and my eggs it's and the, the basics like that. But there's all the ingredients you're going to put into these cookies. Next, of course, mix all the dry ingredients first. Um, you can always screenshot the still image of the recipe that I showed you before I started cooking it. If you want to try it, it was still a good recipe um, regardless of whether it's diabetic friendly or not. Less sugar is always better for you. Sugar is terrible for you. But I just mix in the wet ingredients now. I use unsweetened applesauce, oil, and eggs as my wet ingredients plus a tables or a teaspoon, sorry, of vanilla. Mix it. It's going to be kind of a runny batter, which it even says in the instructions on the recipe. And then I put little spoon-sized amounts onto a baking sheet with some tin foil and cooked it at 375 per the instructions. And they said that you should cook it for 12 minutes. I went and checked on it at 10 minutes and they were done. My oven cooks a little faster, I guess. So um, definitely keep checking on them if you're going to try this recipe at home. And when I tasted them, I thought um, they were okay. But the recipe, I think, uses too much salt. It should just be a pinch of salt instead of a whole teaspoon of salt. And um, they were all right. They tasted more like a raisin bread than they did a cookie. It's okay. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to hit subscribe and hit that notification button because we have tons of videos going live very soon. See you next time. Bye.